Andreas Schwab, thank you very much for your availability. Obviously, we'll start with the DMA, and I propose uh, we divide this conversation into two parts. So we'll start with broader issues, more strategic, and then we'll revert to some technical aspects as well. So with the broader issues, I know that when you talk particularly in, in competition law and economics community, we see people who uh, look at the DMA from different perspectives, something that it's primarily related to, you know, to boosting uh, competition on the horizontal level, trying to somehow to tame those uh, biggest in the, in, 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 the, in the tech industry, trying to allow others to enter into this, in, into this rapidly evolving, rapidly changing and rapidly growing uh, business. And thus the, the, the main purpose of the, of the DMA of this asymmetric regulation must be precisely in allowing new entrants, more fairer and more realistic opportunities to enter into this uh, gatekeeping status essentially. Others say that it's more about vertical aspects and trying to introduce more fair and more um, responsible rules of competition inside inside uh, corporate form services. Obviously, there are those who say that there is diagonal rules. There are many geometrical figures uh, involved, but uh, and obviously all objectives are relevant. But from the, the the center of gravity, what what in your view is the center of gravity of the DMA? I think the center of gravity, uh, Oles, and uh, I think you have outlined that quite well, is for sure to see the broader picture and to make sure that digital markets with their few specificities, high um, concentration effects, high network combination effects, uh, and, there, and very fast and dynamic uh, markets, um, that we find an answer to this in a horizontal manner. And that's the key uh, driving element. And then it's true that there are some questions around better interoperability, which is a little element of, of the, the, the main question here have been added. But the key question is making the market, the digital market again, as large as possible. So to allow new innovative companies to participate there as well. And obviously then the question is, if you're talking primarily or not least about horizontal dimension, then obviously those who deal with competition law and, and try to extrapolate the logic of Article 102 to the, uh, to the designation of uh, the gatekeepers, we understand that it's, it's of a binary nature. You, either, you are either qualified and then the whole heavy burden of obligations uh, is imposed on your shoulders or you are one step behind qualification and thus you are not, uh, the obligations of DMA is not uh, applicable to you at all as a, as a company. Thus designation may matter and criteria for designation for designation are very important. And if, if I recollect from, from your draft proposal, uh, from your draft report uh, on the DMA proposal, uh, there were discussions about uh, uh, undertakings who operate at least two core platform services. And now in the version of the parliament of, uh, adopted in the first reading, we see that this proposal has not been uh, anymore in the, in the final text. Can you elaborate on this? What, are, what were the reasons for proposing this uh, two plus formula and why it has not been supported? Well, if you have a, a look on digital markets, but you could also have a look on markets in general, but if you have a look on digital markets, you may see that the key problem of the gatekeepers uh, discussion is that they have a huge power on specific areas of the market. And that huge power can be twofold. It can either be that they control a very small unit in the market that has to be used by nearly everyone. That is called a bottleneck. The best examples are the two app stores of Android and um, Apple, because if you wanna be in the modern digital economy with all these handhelds that there are, you have to be on one of these two platforms. So these two elements might be gatekeeping positions in form of bottlenecks. But there is another uh, um, concern that is also important for gatekeepers. And that is that you have the power to leverage from one core platform service into another one. And that means that, for example, 
you have a search engine. And with the search engine, you can move people that are frequenting the search engine into your um, shopping portal. Or you have a um, very good uh, software or a very expanded and broadly recognized software. And you put people onto your um, email system. So there are, so to say, two elements. The first one is uh, one service that is so over important that it's a dominant market player by the very nature, the so-called bottlenecks, or the leverage element where you can use a very strong market position in one core platform service to push all the people that use it to your own other core platform service. And to cover both of these questions and not only the bottleneck question, I thought that the leverage element has to be addressed in a very clear manner from the very beginning. Because what we want to fix with the Digital Markets Act is the, the peak of the problems. We don't want to fix all the problems in the internet. For that, we have the Digital Services Act. We have other uh, legal tools. Here, we want to reach the peak. And the peak has to be defined as narrowly as possible. Because if not, you don't have a real mountain. You have rather uh, 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 um, uh, some, some other elements of a geography. But a very clear top mountain has to have a peak. And this peak has to be defined clearly. And for that, the two most important elements for gatekeepers are either bottleneck positions or leverage positions. And with this two CPS, that should have been covered. But unfortunately, it was too, uh, for a lot of colleagues, it was a too limiting exercise. And I had to accept that uh, the Digital Markets Act is not anymore a purely a peaky oriented legislation, but which looks maybe on, on, on other mountains around as well. Let me elaborate on this a little bit. So I noticed from observing just, you know, neutrally uh, the, the discussion that some proposals which prima facie aim to strengthen the DMA paradoxically uh, make, make it a little bit weaker. Those who want to expand it uh, uh, horizontally some, somehow saying that the obligations which we want to develop further, they must not be limited only to, to the gatekeepers. We have to expand it further across other industries. They unintentionally perhaps uh, backfire usually. So um, um, at, the current, uh, at the current version, evidently, we are talking about not very, very narrow uh, format of designation. We uh, talk about a little bit wider, but still we, we see some companies who would not be a, who would not be qualified as GILQ designated to the status of gatekeepers. And uh, bearing in mind this first, my first question about the geometries, uh, uh, horizontal dimension, I wonder, um, uh, wouldn't we somehow uh, create a situation that those who are ready to enter the EU, EU market and those who are ready to scale up, um, should we look also, apart from geometry, also at geography as well? Is it something which is being discussed uh, within transatlantic uh, trade? the transatlantic partnership, different formats, which are now being uh, somehow intensified uh, further. And do we look also at the East? How are all these dialogues, multi-logs uh, are evolving at the moment? Well, first of all, I think it's obvious that um, there are some elements of your question that are self-explaining. I just had before you, um, I had an interview with the Finnish think tank and we are talking about um, the same questions. And the professor who did the interview said he had asked his students how uh, he would advise the gatekeepers to argue on the DMA. And they have all said to him, yeah, but they should argue that it should be enlarged because like that, there are plenty of companies in the scope and like that, they are not anymore so much under control. Um, so it's a, 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 let's say a very boring uh, um, exercise to think why there is that discussion. And we have to say that the DMA doesn't come out of a sudden. The DMA is some sort of further development of already existing European policies. We have several single market policies. We have European competition policy. And so companies that are not in the DMA, they don't fall out of everything. They are covered by plenty of other legislation. They also have to respect market rules in Europe. 
And therefore, if they are not covered by the DMA with their behavior, they may, ca may be caught with other laws. So you don't, no one should be concerned that uh, there will be all, all areas of the digital single market that stay the wild rest. There, will, there are laws for everything. But we have seen that some laws were not practical anymore for these very big companies. And therefore, I think it was important to make clear uh, that it should really be focused, this legislation, on the peak, as I have explained to you already. And I have to tell you a little story. Vivian Reding, the former uh, Data Protection Commissioner uh, some years ago, she came to me once and said to me, Andreas, you are so uh, good that you have managed that this is really focused because with GDPR, we have wanted to do the same. And in the end, with the application uh, in all member states, we ended up with kindergarten parents groups that had to make sure that the GDPR is respected. And that was never really the aim. The aim was to make sure that at large company level, data protection is a reality and that we have not managed to make sure. Therefore, this time it is important that whilst the DSA is there for the whole internet, the DMA only should focus on the biggest ones. And for sure, the biggest ones, they can come from wherever they want. They can come from Brazil or New Zealand, or they can come from other countries. The question is not where they come from. The question is what gatekeeping role they play and how that can be avoided. And this to be avoided is in the interest of all countries in Europe, of all countries in the world, because we are fixing a problem for the market, for the users. We don't fix a problem for a specific company or for a specific uh, uh, country. And therefore, it's in the aim of, in the interest of everything to achieve this aim and not the other way around. Indeed. Okay, let us now move to the substantive uh, aspects after discussing this kind of broader, broader, uh, broader things. And my, my first questions, uh, question about the substantive obligation is again concerns the, di the difference between two versions of the DMA, uh, the Commission's one and the uh, and the one adopted by the parliament. And we can see one of the main, you know, stark uh, differences that, that we, uh, the, the, the mechanism of commitments, which is kind of inherited from, from the ex post competition law is proposed to be abolished. So what, what is the reason behind it? And how do you want to somehow to, what, what is an, an alternative for, for, for this mechanism? That, or do we need such alternatives? Well, you know, the European Parliament is a very large democratic body, and there are for sure plenty of reflections um, that have to be brought together. The commitment um, idea in general can be very useful if the law is unclear to make companies behaving as the regulators want them to behave. But if the law is clear, you cannot make a commitment to apply it. You have to. And that is a bit the basic reflection behind that um, uh, element that we have been skipping in the parliament. We have been saying there is that much of clarity in Article 5 and 6, and the circumvention rule, the new one that I have proposed in Article 6a, that there is not anything what people, uh, what companies can commit to. They have to apply it. Finished. And therefore, there is um, a, a more flexibility given also to the Commission to say how they interpret specific rules in Article 5 and 6, and they have to apply them. That will for sure be a very complex uh, um, administrative and legal uh, challenge, but I have no doubt that the Commission can, can deal with it. And um, it's only one of the elements where the Parliament has been changing uh, this proposal a bit. We have also been um, making the conditions for um, structural measures um, a bit easier um, because we have two sorts of measures that the Commission can uh, adopt if companies don't uh, respect the law. Then they can go for behavioral measures, uh, asking them to respect uh, five and six and, and also pushing them with uh, penalties to do so. But they can also ask them as the FTC in the US about, is about to try with Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram to uh, structurally um, unbundle uh, existing conglomerates. That will be a, a legal challenge in Europe, but it's possible and we have reduced the difficulties to do so. We have increased the uh, penalties. We have been making also some provisions on merger control because uh, 
companies are buying each other and very often the European Union, which is then the relevant institution has no overview on it. And we have been adopting measures that should be creating transparency on it. We have been also um, making articles five and six, the, the, the do's and don'ts, the obligation and the rules that companies have to respect a bit larger, a bit more uh, tough. And we have, uh, um, as we have already been discussing about that, uh, increase the scope and created the European Commission as the, the main institution to discuss with companies on how to interpret Article 5 and 6. And with that ensemble, with that uh, tool book, um, uh, rule book and toolbox, sorry, we have given, uh, I think, um, at the hands of the Commission something that they can use. Because uh, why for me this uh, mechanism appears to be very harmoniously uh, suited into the logic of regulatory dialogue, because I understand that the, the, the pedigree of commitment implies that it's kind of one way uh, street, it's not a dialogue, it's kind of a, a proposal by the infringer, by an infringer to to remedy the situation, so to say, but it could be, they could be eventually, hypothetically, um, evolved into the proper mechanism of dialogue where you can, you, you have this real uh, stick uh, in, 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 uh, hanging on the wall, which somehow can uh, trigger, impel the, 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 the enforce, uh, the, the, the gatekeepers to comply not only with the letter of law, but also with the spirit of law. And this leads me uh, perfectly to the issue which you have highlighted already, you have mentioned it, uh, the anti-circumvention provision. It was one of the quite hot issues in the discussions in 2021. And uh, it looks very different to the quite innovative proposal by the commission. You have in, uh, introduced further innovation into the mechanism. And A, you mentioned that it's now in article 6A, which in itself is quite telling because we understand that it's, even if the obligations are susceptible to being further specified, the, li the liability is, is direct. Um, and thus, uh, I wonder, I understand the logic of, of, of uh, anti-circumvention provision, because if you're very super heavyweight, you have 1001 methods to comply with the letter of law and achieving the same results by other means, and thus circumventing the, 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 the law. So anti-circumvention provisions are perfect mechanism here. But if you make direct liability, we can, if you impose liability for not complying only with this letter of law, so we, we have the situation when the company complies with the letter of law and it doesn't deliver the expected results, or what would be this uh, 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 situation where the, the company complies with the letter of law and still finds itself liable? Well, um... I, I, I think it's a very difficult question. The key concern that Parliament has is that Article 5 and 6 are not somehow circumvented in a way that companies can claim we respect the law, but in the end it is impossible for users, for business users, for consumers, uh, to really feel the advantages of these rules and obligations of Article 5 and 6. Now, there are, is a lot of speculation how that could be done. One example is all the time for uh, uh, the, the element of uh, consent to data sharing, consent to cookie policies, which sometimes is so um, forceful um, that you may feel that there are even specific tools like dark patterns used to make you agree and to give consent. I think in the end, it's always a choice of the user, but it's also important that the user has an easy choice. And I think this circumvention can be seen in that manner that existing rights should be accessible easily. But you may also see that, for example, uh, last week, uh, one gatekeeper has announced that it wants to change it's an um, advertising uh, policy. Uh, I think we can wait another gatekeeper to adopt a policy to have several payment uh, systems accepted. So uh, gatekeepers are already about to adapt to the law that is not yet even um, in the rule book. And also these behaviors have to be covered uh, because for sure, if you are a very dynamic company, and that's exactly the, 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 the positive element of the digital markets, you can adopt to the law, adapt to the law very easily, 
and thereby also trying to circumvent it. But that's exactly what we won't accept. But it's very difficult to write something like that into the law. It has to be done by administrative measures of the police, so to say. And, um, and, and therefore, we need the European Commission in the end in some sort of a role of a policeman. So basically, if I am an un unmentioned gatekeeper aiming to somehow to uh, mimicry to the to the requirements and uh, somehow try to abandon third party cookies and internalize essentially all the, the mechanism of online advertising within my own platform, uh, it, it would imply that anti-circumvention provisions would prevent such uh, unknown gatekeepers from from evolving its business model, trying to to somehow to adjust it to the new reality. It will still catch the the core of the business model, so to say, regardless of of its format. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, all, all right. Speaking of liability, we understand, of course, that uh, the, the structural separation is is an important remedy available in the in the toolkit. It's rarely used. It's a kind of uh, but it's important to have it on the table, but I would suggest on the wall, hanging on the wall peacefully, but still indicating its, its potential power. And obviously we often hear about the, the, the fines in, uh, proposed in the, in, the, in, in, in the DMA. My question is not about the size of the maximum fine, which is somehow still the matter of discretion for the enforcer, but about the minimum fine. Do you think it's some... Um, uh, uh, this four percent of minimum fine is it something which is uh, probably you know uh, how would it supposed to, to to work? Can you elaborate, please? Well, this has been a special uh, argument um, to show to the public that the law has teeth, um, but um, I don't believe that the penalties are something that gatekeepers will really make changing their behavior because they have so good uh, income cost, uh, structures that what matters in the end is the power of authorities to impose uh, behaviors or structural changes, but not so much um, um, penalties. So it has been rather a political uh, decision uh, and it's a, it's a clear, uh, uh, signal that uh, it's not a joke, the DMA, it's uh, the legal reality that has to be respected. But I don't think that companies are scared because of the penalties, that the real power of the DMA lies elsewhere. Yeah, understandable. But if it's if 4% of global annual turnover, for a company with turnover of 200 billion, let's say it will be a penalty of minimum penalty of 8 billion uh, euros. I wonder if it, if it would not have a kind of an opposite effect, uh, making the commission more risk averse, so to say. Is, it, is there a possibility for such situation? Absolutely, but I, I'm following also other policy areas of the European Union since more than uh, 18 years. I have always been very reluctant to the um, penalty co calculation in the European competition policy, for example, because the turnover is not uh, what a company keeps after having uh, spent the money on uh, supply services and other stuff. It's just what is the calculation of the whole business. And business it is not always return on investment. It's also investment. Um, and therefore, that calculation is always a bit misleading. But it has unfortunately been started somewhere. And therefore, this is always used. Therefore, uh, you are right. There could, be a, there could be a backfiring effect. However, um, it's not that a danger that we should now focus on, but it's true that too high penalties do not work. That's true. Particularly in the context which you mentioned earlier that it's not about penalties as such, it's about shaping pro-competition regime for digital markets, if we, if we use vocabulary of the United Kingdom for, the, for this matter. And obviously I cannot, uh, not, cannot not ask you, I know we are very limited uh, in time, like about the question which is uh, everywhere in, in, in the discussion about this, the, the sharing the competence between the enforcers, because it's not a dilemma essentially, we're talking about two good formats. On one hand, we want to give everything into hands of the, I don't talk about fragmentation, I'm talking about the, the efficiency of the mechanism. We want to give everything in one hand to have this um, you know, strategic vision of the commission in enforcing it. But also when we talk about such complex mechanism, an ability not to enforce specific 
uh, obligation with a specific gatekeeper as a means of kind of game, game theoretical communication, trying to steer, particularly when we don't have any more commitments mechanism, trying to steer it in the right direction and trying to, be, you, have, you need good cops and bad cops, so to say. And I wonder, on the other hand, however, we understand that there are such world leading competition authorities in many EU member states, uh, not using expertise of whom would be, uh, you know, suicidal. There is, it's, it's, it's impossible to ignore. So we, we are facing the, uh, the situation with two good options, um, very unified uh, and uh, centralized model, and a little bit, a little bit more um, uh, federated, perhaps. So I wonder which one, in your view, should, should persist? Well, I think the distribution of tasks uh, is very clear uh, on the Digital Markets Act, which is a single market policy and a single market regulation. It has to be the European Commission who is applying Article 5 and 6 and can be assisted if needed by national uh, authorities. And on the application of other union policies, it's other authorities that are competent. Um, on the European Electronic Communication Code, it's BEREC and the National uh, telecommunications authorities on the European competition policy. It's the European competition policy network. And um, I think they have to make sure that they work perfectly together. As the DMA will be a new tool, they have to adapt, but I have no doubt that they will manage. And like that, they can be, let's say, using their capacities uh, to improve the um, functioning of the neighboring uh, system and they can complement each other. That has to be the aim, but I think we will need some years to, to get there. Um, and in the meantime, the question is as to whether this veto power that has been decided by parliament is a useful tool to make sure that there are no contradictory decisions. I myself, I personally believe that there will be no contradicting uh, decisions because all the authorities will try to streamline their decision-making processes in the same direction. And therefore, we will be discussing in the trialogues how we can make sure that the national level and the European level work perfectly together, um, also in the area of digital market policies. And in this context, uh, is the version of the Council uh, is a little bit too uh, pro, pro member states, national competition agencies, in your view? Do you think they, they cross this invisible line? Well, the Council is the representation of 27 member states. They will always be more in favor of member states. There is nothing special with it. I think on the DMA, they are quite clearly uh, European uh, compared to what they have been uh, declaring in, 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 in the last uh, 30 years on, on other areas. So it's a very clear pro-European uh, process here. But now we have to find the right balance. And for that, we have to find some, some sort of middle way between the text of the commission, the parliament and the council on the governance uh, um, um, of cooperation between member states and European Union. I know we're running out of time. Let me ask you the last question. I understand that you are bound by formal and informal ethical deontological rules. But what is your gut feeling? Are you, are you optimistic as everything goes as planned? And to what extent this, the most realistic in your view version of the DMA would reflect your ideal expectation from, from, from the proposal? Well, I think we can uh, definitely be optimistic because uh, already the proposal of the Digital Markets Act is a very uh, important landmark. And um, now it's about to implement it and to um, finalize it. And uh, we are very close. I'm very optimistic that we can achieve this. And the aim should be that even in digital markets, even if you have the power to destroy your competitors with some sort of business practices and tricks, you are not allowed to do so, except if your competitor is uh, not innovating anymore and is boring and stupid but you don't have the power to destroy your competitors because the European and the worldwide markets are used best if there is competition, if there is fair competition. And we are here to defend the interests of all the users of all the uh, supply companies that will be better off if there is competition 
if they can choose uh, um, operators. And you have seen, for example, um, when, when uh, Boeing was not anymore the only uh, uh, company that could construct very big planes, but Airbus was there as well, a lot of uh, companies that were very well working together with Boeing, they switched to Airbus with 50% of their airplanes because they want to have some sort of, of leverage when discussing about buying new planes. And it will be the same in digital markets. It's good if you have very strong big players, but it's better if you have two or three so that the market develops in all the different areas and is not uh, um, driven by monopolies. Andreas Schwab, thank you very much indeed for sharing your ideas with us. Thank you so much, Oles.